guys your boy mr old school rider come back at you one more again i have a very special guest with me at downtown with mr old school rider on hey use your inside voice season two episode number seven i have a host he know everything about atlanta he's very educational i learned a lot of stuff i didn't know about atlanta myself i have my special guest i have the king king williams so what's going on brother hey now thank you for having me we do appreciate you. I'm going to let you have a floor here for a little bit like we're at church. So tell us about yourself, King. Uh, so King Williams, I am from Decatur, Georgia, uh, which is not too far from here, about 20 minutes away from here in downtown. Um, I am a I'm a person who loves Atlanta. I'm from Georgia, uh, obviously. The thing that I think people like yourself come to me about is I'm always talking about Atlanta and Atlanta history. So most people know me about that or they know me actually about gentrification. So that's one of the two things that people come to me for. Um, I've been born and raised here. And so one of the things I always had, which was who's telling the story in the history of Atlanta. And it's something I didn't know a lot about until I really got to college. And so my parents did all they could to teach me about Atlanta, but they're not actually from Atlanta themselves. And so, you know, it was just a hunger and getting older and you just kind of find two things that align with your passion. And that's kind of how we got here today. Oh man, I like that, man. You make that sound so good. So um, I found you on Twitter like a while back on my um, the Riders Book Club Twitter page, which I don't have no subscribers, not many, but you that's will. part of my. It's, it's, it, it's, I already got my name on it pretty much, but yeah, I happen to see you like in the feed talking about gentrification and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this dude is knowledgeable. Oh, word. thank you. So tell us a little bit about you. You may know a little bit more about me. I see I see certain things happen like in mm -hmm. the hood or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this don't look good when the house is getting fixed up real good. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it starts like in the corner lot, or maybe like the uh, like in the covered set of the uh, neighborhood. I'm like, hold on. I guess they call it like modern houses or whatever. Mm -hmm. Once one of those pop up, it, it just go downhill from there. But I want you to get you, I want to get you on the show. It kind of tells a little bit more what it actually mean, like technical wise. Yeah. So uh, I got a preference this too for a lot of people. When we talk about gentrification, uh, there's you got to say it's a bigger thing, right? So. Uh, for your listeners, gentrification comes from a root word called gentry, which comes from an English word, which means of, and that goes back to even back to the days of feudal France and feudal Britain, where, and if you, you know, if you watch a lot of like uh, the knights and things like that, Game of Thrones, a lot of that has to deal with like the era of like the British and the French aristocracy. So the French had a word called gentry, and the English, it translated to gentry. So when you think of things like the kings and knights, um, even the word landlord actually comes from lord of the land. The landlord will be the person who is responsible for picking up taxes and allocating land and funds. And so the gentry was all these people who worked in service of the monarchy or in service of those who work for the monarchy. And so the woman who came up with the term gentrification, her name is Ruth Glass. She's also from London. And so when she's studying it, she just said, this looks like gentrification. And so when she wrote it in London, people in England already got it because they had a connection to it. And so when the word kind of migrates to America, it doesn't really come around to like the 1960s and places like New York and things like that. And people start mm. using it. And so now when we're having this conversation about gentrification, I always tell people that people define gentrification on how they feel it is. And not necessarily, and that, there's nothing wrong with that because I think that's actually important to assert where you are um, in your mental space. But actually it comes from an older word and it does come from like the nobility and it comes from really a system of, of class and capital. And so when we talk about everything else, like we're going to talk about with gentrification, we got to put that in mind, kind of level set, because I think a lot of people don't really get that. Also, uh, full disclosure, I had a documentary on gentrification called The Atlanta Way, another one on PBS now called East Lake Meadows Public Housing Authority. Um, I did a TED talk on it and I do a lot of work in this space. And I also yeah. did that in my undergrad at Georgia State. So I don't want to seem like I'm just coming out of nowhere with it. Oh, you on TED Talks? Yeah, I did one of those. Man, I wish that, I could man. do another one. Though. I wish I could have another one. Man, everybody point. can't get on there, man. You gotta I, be somebody to be on that. No, I wish I had another one. <laughs> like I was, it was I was oh, way you too. Was nervous back then? No, yeah, I just messed up on. It. I was like, I wish. I when I was nervous, I was like, you know what? This is not. I should have just done something different. And I think it'll come around at some point in the future. I mean, the work that you're putting in right now in the community, it, it's coming, man. It's gonna be the hey, you wanna come on back? Yeah, I hope so. And I think to what you said earlier about like you seeing people like moving in and you starting to see these changes on like these little empty lot houses. And we talk about gentrification. The reason why it feels that way to you, to me, to our cousins is because using the context of where it came from, we understand the class differences. We also understand who this land is now for, mm -hmm. which is why people really have a sticking point with gentrification, because effectively, when you look at it, it's a study of the haves and the have nots. The have nots feel the impact more than the haves do for the haves. 
it's a way to grow. It's a way to build up economically. Um, but for the have not, they understand long term what this means for them. And so that's why you have these kind of class tensions happening. And the thing I always tell people is black people can gentrify the black people, white people can gentrify white people. And when it comes to gentrification, understand that it's a spectrum, right? So it look, may look different in St. Louis than it does in Atlanta, but the mechanics are still the same. And who gets gentrified is different as well. So that can happen anywhere, any place on the, in the country. Yeah, when I first moved here back in 2019 from Dallas, Texas, as soon as I came to Atlanta, I seen like the home. That's one of the signs of home, the homelessness or whatever. Yeah, I was homeless for a little bit. I was in my car for a little mm. while. You know, I, I mean, you know, a lot of things happen or whatever. But you know, I stayed focused. I was working or whatever. But you know, housing kind of crazy out here. In Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to be close to my job. It just didn't happen. I had to be like, I got grinded out for a little while, you know, stack my bread, paid everything off. When it was time for me to get my own place or whatever, I went ahead and did it. You know, I dropped it down. But when I was out there, you know, in the car, I know it was, uh, homeless is one of the signs of gentrification. I know it ain't not, not, not in the technical sense, but I recognize that being from Dallas. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these people might be in like in certain neighborhoods and so they might have got pushed out or they couldn't afford their taxes. It's one thing some people be like in these old neighborhoods and they tax like real cheap. But you know, like some people pretty much like on fixed income, they get like behind on their tax, they pretty much get pushed out. Or they might lose it for whatever reason. I mean, you know, those properties be real cheap. You know, you give them like mm-hmm. pennies on a dollar. Yeah, and even before we started this interview, I was like, while you were getting set up, I was reading about this woman in Martin Luther King's old neighborhood, this older black woman. She's probably in like her 80s now. Oh. Somebody took her deed from her and then they started bulldozing her house and i was reading that right before we got in and we started talking about this i read this i read that story last night too man. yeah i was, like, I was like, so sad yeah and that's kind of where we are when it comes to gentrification a lot of times until your point about homelessness like i said it's a spectrum right so you being a guy who has a job but you still can't have a place to live some people will say well you know that's not necessarily you being gentrified as much as it is that's a housing issue right and so one of the things i always kind of push back with it is a lot of people who study gentrification talk about gentrification they kind of want to minimize it or they try to make it seem like it's a better thing for everyone but in reality like it people really do feel those consequences you're just not a name or a number on a sheet of paper you're a human being and so that's one of the things i do a lot in the space and that the the larger space what we study that is called this thing called urbanism and so like there's not a lot of black urbanists in that space and so one of the things i try to do is tell people like hey we have a spectrum here we got to realize that sometimes people aren't being counted in the narrative or some people aren't going to be uh, factored into some of the decisions that we make and so when i talk about gentrification a lot with people it, it causes especially on twitter it, it, it can cause it a lot of back and forth uproar, man. it does but i'm like the people who argue about it are also a lot of times the people who have something to benefit from it and for them they just want to see a nice coffee shop or they just want to yeah see a nice painted house i'm like i want those things too like i don't think you go to the people in the hood they want those things too they don't necessarily know they said they necessarily don't want to be put out from now they don't want to be arrested in their neighborhood they don't want their granny to have their deed gone out because people see the value and what their neighborhood is now than it, when you could have had the same house years ago so that's kind of where we are yeah what i recognize uh coming from texas or whatnot like you said before you want like a nice coffee shop like something nice but some of the areas get run down. You want the same thing, but you have some people who don't have your best interest, like that's maybe above you or whatever. Then when everything get ran down, you get pushed out. You know, other people come in. Next thing you know, you got a coffee shop, Starbucks, whatever you want. You know, nice stuff, like a barista or whatever. Yeah. You no know, little sandwich shop. That could have been done, you know, with the regular people. It could have changed the neighborhood while, I mean, around, but... They pretty much wait on the opportunity just to get you up out of there. Also, you got other people be plotting on your house. You know, like you said, the D stuff. Yeah. Man, you know, people, you know, it's like all the time people driving around, you know, just be looking around, being nosed. They plotting on you. You have to you have to watch your old folks sometimes when they get like new friends and stuff like that. People yeah. just saying they checking on you, but they checking on your house and your D. Yeah. They trying to figure out if you're going, if you're sick or whatever the case may be. They just waiting to strike. That's kind of how it is, though. And this is kind of like a broader thing about the U.S. It's a very predatory housing market right now. Everyone can get money for a house no matter where it is. So everyone's going to do what it takes to get a house and sell a house as much as they can. So 
we're not going to see the end of that behavior for a while just because of where the country is. We just have less houses to go. And it's not like necessarily it's, it's like we're in a like there's no houses, right? People are still building houses that we haven't built a lot of houses for years. Mm. Um, and we can get into that. That's a longer conversation why we don't have that. But just in short, note Dallas to Atlanta to L.A., everyone has a housing shortage. So then it makes everyone's houses more valuable, even in the hood. So like everyone's house is more value than it should should be. Yeah, even with my old, even with my dad's neighborhood, it's like an old slave clump. Come, golly, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, where my old man stay at in Dallas, mm-hmm. it's, they pretty much built like a brand new golf course for the PGA. Mm-hmm. It's like pretty much down the street. They tried to do it back in the day, but it kept getting flooded out. Mm-hmm. So they basically uh, took the old dumping ground from Dallas. They made it into a golf course. Mm-hmm. Man, it's all, it's that time, man. Mm-hmm. You know, my, look at my old man. He went ahead and put some money into his house and kind of cleaned it up. Had it redone on the inside and outside. Mm-hmm. And other people was doing as well. Yeah, other people trying to get some of these older folks like uh, predatory, uh, pre- what do you call it? Predatory, predatory lending. Pre- yeah, there you go. Yeah. Lending on, on their house. A lot of people been lo- losing their homes. They want to fix it up, but they can't keep up with them payments. Yeah. And that's been the thing too, especially if you're older, right? So in Atlanta, they have this thing called code enforcement. So let's just say, you know, if I have a granny and she stays on the west side over here, um, my granny's 80, right? So if they're actually 90. So if they go to see, oh, hey, you know, they, Miss Williams, we're going to give you a code enforcement violation for you not, not having a grass cut on time. Or, hey, Miss Williams, we think one of your windows needs to be up to date or your gutters aren't clean. And so a lot of new neighbors or a lot of some, who you're talking about, people who are like either speculators, people who flip homes, people who just live in the neighborhood sometimes or just want to hate, will give you enough code violation. Then the city of Atlanta comes in and they issue a bigger fine mm-hmm. and then they can even evict you evict you if it gets worse right and that happens to a lot of old people because like they just don't have the money like or they don't have the physical ability to do some of the things that, that's required to do that man that's a lot of hate you absolutely right man my old that was messing with my old man for a minute he knew the game he worked for the city uh back in the mm-hmm. old days he saw what was going on you know you know he had the stuff going on they were just calling just making shit up you know yeah then cold uh cold enforcement come by like oh you do good yeah but you know people want to have something on record yeah, that's kind of how it is. Like, they, once you get a paper trail, it's, I tell people all the time, once you get a paper trail, it's just a matter of time, right? Like, once you get that first slip, it's easier to get the second slip, then it's easier to eventually end up in court, then you're really behind on things. And all of a sudden, you're out, or now you got to take out a loan that you can't pay for to keep up with this stuff, and then you fall behind that loan, and you lost your house in six months. It can happen real fast. And I Man. think that, and it's not just Atlanta or Dallas, like anywhere right now, especially if you're in a black neighborhood. You like you don't have the legal protection. You like you don't have a homeowner association vouching for you. That's true. That hey, you know your dad's a good guy. Like we, our communities aren't built like that, so we're more susceptible, which makes it easier for people to come in and kind of step on it. I mean, most of the time, I think the black community be closer to downtown. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, I think back in the day, downtown. I mean, I guess our areas are kind of like push us away. Mm-hmm. But come to find out, you know, other people want to go far away from downtown. Then later on, they kind of figure out, you know, know what? I need to be closer to my job. So they come back to the black community, Plyden. I mean, you know, everybody do it, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to blame one set of people, but you know, everybody do it. It's like, that's how you get other people in trouble, pretty much. Then you lose your house. Like you said before, you end up like they lady. Yeah. Man, that is so, I've seen it happen quite a bit in Dallas, man. Mm-hmm. That, that, that actually sad, that man. breaks my heart, really, because especially with the old people, like, these people probably worked their whole lives for that house. Man, they tore a house down and everything, man. Yeah, that that makes it worse. Like just to hear about that, like I see that not because see you came here later, but like I kind of lived a lot of that through Atlanta, especially if you live between like ninety. If you basically lived in Atlanta from like nineteen ninety to like two thousand and five, two thousand seven. You got to see a lot of that, especially if you're on the west side, especially if you live near a public housing project. You saw that all the time. And I tell people all the time, the Atlanta that we live in now is built upon the Atlanta that got pushed out of public housing a decade ago. Mm. And it also, the other Atlanta that got most of, like, especially on the west side here, most of those, like, apartment buildings got uh, shut, out, shut down or closed for, like, low-income people mm. around that same time. So, like, now the Atlanta, and when people call stuff like West Midtown, that, that's not a real thing. That's not a real name, but, like when most of your residents either got pushed out because of public housing or they got pushed out because of like people doing predatory practices or they got pushed out because they closed down most of the apartments. Most of the West side is renters. So it was actually easy to see how many people can get pushed out because there's just less people with protections. And so that's kind of where we are. And I think the black community as a whole, we got to start having to come to Jesus moment on how do we start protecting our communities? Cause we're losing them 
and we're losing them over silly stuff. Like it's not like crazy things. We're losing them over pieces of paper or code violations. Yeah. And that that that's got to be more than that. A dog or whatever. They, oh, yeah. I'm in the old cars and stuff. I see a lot of violation happen to like older cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though sometimes they may or may not have their registration, it's not a nuisance. But people pick on the smallest things. Like, oh, your tag is not up to date. Yeah. I mean, even though your car might be covered up with a carport, you know, people are going at, going to yard, you know, trying to find something. I'm like, I'm gonna get this part. Yeah, that actually happened to my parents. They had, they had a, like a lot of black people in, in Atlanta, especially like you, you know, they get a car, it, it might be a little bit of a bucket, then they leave it in the backyard, right? It's not in the front yard, it's not in the street, it's not bothering nobody. Cover up. Yeah, and then a couple people call like one of my, the cars my dad had. He had a, it stopped working for like five years, right? Mm. But you know, like black people, you, you still got to pay on it, right? You can't get rid of it, right, and so. Right. He ain't have nowhere else to put it, right? He can either put more money into a car that he already put money on, he can get a new car. And so one of his neighbors called code enforcement on him and it became a real thing and to the yeah. point where it was like, the man has his car in the backyard, it's not bothering nobody. Another neighbor didn't like it and then it becomes an issue. And then, you know, I see that a lot, especially on the east side of Atlanta. Like you see that a lot more than the west side just because the culture is a little different over there. Than is it that is the next area right now they trying to work on? Kind of. The, I, I kind of know as they messing with it, but not really. I think they're still working on the west side, right? Yeah, the money's in either in Midtown or on the west side right now. And it's coming back east, but it's coming further southeast. So, like, closer to, like, southwest of Cab in that area. Mm -hmm. Like, Moreland Avenue and all of that, so. I got a question, man. Why Atlanta breaking up, man? It's been breaking up for a while. What do you mean? You know, like, different cities and stuff. It's turning, like... Yeah. I, I notice when I try to... I ain't gonna put my business out there. You know, sometimes I door dash and stuff pretty much. Mm -hmm. You know, try to, you know, make a little money for my hustle and stuff. Paying for my book fair and our journal next this year, of course. Y'all yeah, notice when I look up my address, I see Atlanta on it. I'm like, this ain't no Atlanta. This like uh I know Brookhaven's like a newer city and Channel Lee and all those other towns. Yeah. I don't know, you know, the history of that. What happened with that? Yeah, so that is I I wrote on that for this other paper I write. I also I'm a journalist also. So I wrote this is a long story short, but long story, it's a history of, of white racism, of white people effectively moving out of the city of Atlanta, create micro cities, right? And when they're not in the city of Atlanta or DeKalb County, which has been majority black since like the 1960s or 70s, mm -hmm. they create their own little cities. And that is the simplest way I can describe that. Brookhaven is a good example. What they're trying to do in Buckhead is the next thing. They're trying to do four of those projects in Cobb, but it won't be black people they're doing that too. They're doing it to a lot of Latino communities up in Cobb where they kind of want to be their own thing. And then in DeKalb, they're trying to do one. And the dynamics of that are a little different, but it's kind of like the same thing. So Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I, I mean I've seen it coming from Texas or whatever, but I know I'm like, what? I'm like, this ain't no Atlanta. This is, you know, such and such. It was. If you say Atlanta, that means it was Atlanta at one point. Yeah. And somebody decided, all right, let's break off. Is Atlanta uh, pretty much in Fulton County all the way now, or close to it? No, nah, Atlanta's still in Fulton and DeKalb. And oh, this, it's still in DeKalb? Yeah, so... What parts of it in DeKalb? Uh, everything from you get from Moreland Avenue over, it, all of that is DeKalb County. Oh, I just thought about it. Oh, it's section all about, uh, oh yeah, the area get kind of, you know, sketchy a little bit. Yeah. It's probably a chicken wing place. I'm trying to think the name already, but I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but that whole Moreland Avenue side, even going up to Emory. Like, so if you go out to Moreland now, you hit Moreland. Everything on one side of Moreland. So the, if you're standing right on the street like I'm standing now, to the left is all Fulton County. To the right is DeKalb County. And the reason is because at one point it was all DeKalb County. Before there's the city of Atlanta, before there's Fulton County, it was all DeKalb County. Fulton County broke away from DeKalb County, and the city of Atlanta broke away from that. And so that's why... It's like that now. And then we had a, we used to have a grid, so you could be, you know, like a up, left, right, east, west. Mm. And for a whole, once, once we started building the highways and stuff, we lost the grid. And so now it doesn't seem like it. But old Atlanta people all know this, like, oh, yeah, you're on the east side. That's why a lot of people, when they say I'm from the east side, they, that's what they actually mean. It means anything from Moreland Avenue onward to the, like, basically 285. So mm. that's what they're talking about. And then now it's moved even further out to people like in Lithonia and people out in, um, where's that, like, even so, I heard people in Conyers trying to say they're on the east side now. So that's kind of how, how how big it's gotten now. Yeah, that's still in DeKalb County, but they, they... Yeah. Yeah, Latonia, that is way out there. Yeah, but it, that was like a cultural thing. But historically, the east side is everything from Moreland Avenue up to 285. So that mm. counts all of East Atlanta. It's all DeKalb at that point, but it's all East Atlanta, Decatur, all of Decatur in one space. So that's what it was. Ooh, yeah, decal is big, man. I didn't realize that. It's bigger than I think people give it credit for. It's the, in terms of the southeast. 
when you talk about density, like the number of people who occupy a space in the whole Southeast, everything from Virginia all the way down to Miami, it is the third densest county in the whole Southeast. Oh, wow. So everything from New Orleans over. And DeKalb County has the same population as D.C. And I think people forget that. It's just like a very, and it's going to get bigger, right? So DeKalb's not getting outward. It's just going up. So there's more people who move there and it's more space to move. So that's kind of where it is now. I mean, even what you said, some people got pushed out, like mm-hmm. like in the city of Atlanta from the projects. They they pretty much getting pushed out to like Thornio, you know, like pretty much getting pushed out towards y'all uh, DeKalb County, what I noticed as well. Yeah, like especially if they can get outside of 285, like the further that's going to. Yeah, some people say, man, I used to live in Atlanta. I'm like, dang, what happened? Most- they tell me the story about, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever, but... But what you're telling me in short, pretty much kind of explain a lot of stuff. Yeah, old Atlanta don't really live in Atlanta anymore for a host of different reasons, but that's kind of why. Like, And Atlanta is like turning over, turning over, turning over, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in five, ten years from now. Yeah, I think with this uh, Buckhead situation, man, they, they trying their best to keep it, but I mean, I hate to be like that, but they're going to end up losing Buckhead, man. It's a 50-50. Um, There's too much money over there. They, go, they fighting for their tax revenue, man. Buckhead is actually not in as good a position they kind of put it out to be, but it's up to the voters. And I think the biggest issue is I, I do a lot of work with Georgia State. My alumni, we we I did an article with them last year and like and we went through all the crime data. Hmm. Buckhead is safer now than it's ever been. I was wondering about that. Yeah, but the difference is if you go to like Instagram crime porn accounts like ATL School, which is ran by this like Trump supporting uh uh white girl. Okay, okay. Um and then a lot of other oh, accounts. About a white chick? Yeah. I don't um, know that. Yeah, so, I mean, but the thing, people, I wrote about that, too. Like, she, a lot of people go to and think this is news, right? So, like, the regular news here, Fox 5, the AJC reported, like, it's also news. If all you see is the 5 o'clock news, mm. and this is across the board in the United States, they don't have to be Atlanta. Only thing that gets shown, and I don't care if you're in Des Moines, Iowa, or Dallas, or here, the only thing that's going to be shown in the first 10 minutes is going to be crime, violence, and fires. Man. This is across the board. And so the other reason is because when people watch the news, they don't, they don't watch the full 30 minutes. They watch about the first 12 to 15 minutes. So if that's all you're leading with, that is the perception. Yep. And, and so that's kind of what's happened with that. Like, it is pretty safe to be in Atlanta. The one issue we do have is, like, break-ins. And so when you talk about car thefts, people breaking Man. into cars, that is an actual issue. But... I would rather have this issue of like, okay, we how do we stop break-ins? Then it's like we are averaging like two or three murders a day. Cause but the way you see it on social media, you see it on local news, you think that's what's happening, right? If even if you watch, right, it's like, oh, there was a shooting in Cumming, Georgia. Cumming, Georgia is like a solid hour for here, but that's leading on the five o'clock news, right? Oh. So then people believe, oh, it's Atlanta's doing. It's like, no, that's Cumming, Georgia. Or you watch, you read it like one of those Instagram accounts. It's a lot of sometimes videos of doctor or like misleading. And so then you think, oh, man, somebody's like shooting here, robbing here. And it's like, no, nah, that's not really how it is. OK. Yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah, we got, OK, we got like look like we got five minutes. So OK. Far, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you're right about that, man. That's, that's, that's you weird, can look it up man. now. Like you can look up the Atlanta crime. Police. Atlanta is one of the few places in the country that lists all their crime stats for the last since 2011. You can look at every single week by mm. the week and you don't have to believe me. You can look it up yourself. Man, what breaks my heart is a Linux mall, man. It's always yeah. something. I'm like, I'm like, Linux mall? Yeah. Le- the crazy thing about Linux is it's not even people from Atlanta who's doing it. I and, know. You know, the outsiders. Well, I, actually, a lot of it has been like that. Right. But it's like. It's been two groups of people, people who are not from Atlanta who come to Atlanta. And Georgia has very lax gun laws. And so when you look at the number of people who got in 2020, all the shootings that happened at Linux were not by people who had a state of Georgia address. Mm. So then it becomes this issue of like, you see, oh, there's crime in Linux. It's like, well, who was actually shooting? We can look at the data. The data is going to say this person came from Alabama. This person came from New York. This but then you're like, oh, man, Linux is going around. I was like, mm. the people who live here kind of know how to operate Linux. The other group of people who are messing up are like young kids. Like yeah. teenagers, especially because they don't have anything to do, and like, and I, you do the map on that too. There's nothing. If I'm between 15 and 21, 20, there is nothing for me to do in any of the five counties. So oh, wow. you can only go to Lenox. You can go only go to Atlantic Station. There is literally nothing else for you to do. So yeah. that's gonna eventually just bring out the worst behavior. All right, before we uh, ride, I'm gonna ask you a question. What was your first and favorite car? Uh my first car was a dodge caravan it didn't work it stopped when i was in high school i had to leave it on the side of the road man it but it got me there my favorite car is a 69 shelby mustang gt yeah i'm a four guy myself you know 68 mustang was my first official car okay that i you know i bought myself without splitting with nobody but before we go out of here what's a good story about the car uh what's the story for the caravan that you had 
Uh, Something positive, hopefully. Well, no, I like the caravan because it's something I earned my money for. So that was the thing, just being proud to, like, you know, I spent I, all my little money, saving all my money in high school, <laughs> and buying a Dodge Caravan. That would what, what, just being proud to be like, this is my car. I own it. It's a caravan. It's not cool, but it's cool to me. So that was, like, my most positive Did moment. your door actually work? Did your door get stuck on the side? It got stuck a little bit, but that's what Dodge care. I don't even know if Dodge do, still man. makes the caravan now. I think they uh, they make hybrids of those now, but oh, they really? still okay. make them. You know, yeah. like Amazon and other people still make them. Oh, uh, okay, okay. But uh, any final thoughts at this time? Uh, no, nah, thank you for having me on the podcast. And, you know, shout out to the Dodge Caravan. You got me through high school, so I want to give you a shout out. Hey, uh, LCA, he, he, he going to need one for his work. I, I would love but one. Other than that, your boy, Mr. Old School Ryan, with Oh, and we out on Hey, You Should Inside Voice Live with King Williams from uh, from Decatur. Well, mm-hmm. you know, he represents Atlanta to the fullest. Mm-hmm. We do appreciate y'all coming through. Peace out.